Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's special webinar. Uh, my name is Maggie Howell, and I'm the executive director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel, and we will provide time for questions at the end of Dr. Peterson's presentation. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be available on the Wolf Conservation Center website uh, in time. Uh, so I hope you're all as excited about this as I am. Um, tonight, we are joined uh, by Dr. Rolf Peterson, who has generously offered his time to discuss the wolves of Isle Royale. Um, Dr. Rolf Peterson is an internationally recognized wildlife ecologist at Michigan Tech University. He began leading the Isle Royale Moose Wolf Study uh, in the early 1970s and has continued his, as his primary role in the project for over four decades of the study's 60 year history. In 2006, Dr. Peterson retired from a faculty position at Michigan Tech um, to devote even more time to the Wolf Moose Project and now spends lots of time on Isle Royale, um, probably more there than the mainland. In addition to wolf research at Isle Royale, he and his students have conducted wolf studies in Alaska, Yellowstone National Park, Minnesota, and mainland Michigan. Also to note, in 2017, Dr. Peterson was among Discover Magazine's uh, favorite scientists of all time. So without further ado, I will turn the time over to one of our favorite scientists too, uh, Dr. Rolf Peterson. Welcome, Rolf. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. This is an awfully easy way to give a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But I, I thought what I'd do for tonight would be concentrate on a couple things. One is uh, why, why bother? Why try, why to try to put wolves back at Isle Royale National Park? Why did the National Park Service go through all this effort <clears throat> to restore a wolf population to Isle Royale? And then the second part would be how, how wolf restoration looks at Isle Royale in the last uh, several months. I should acknowledge uh, the uh, agencies that have funded and supported this work uh, through, the, through the ages, really, primarily the National Science Foundation in, uh, from the federal government and then National Park Service, also a federal agency in the US and uh, Michigan Tech, where I've worked for a long time. Uh, I'm just, uh, I mean, I'm retired and I do the fun stuff, but the real work for much of this research is done by my colleagues, John Bustich and Sarah Hoy. So I want to make sure they get credit for a lot of this stuff. Uh, so it's been big, pretty big news uh, as wolves have been returned to Isle Royale in the last, uh, well, since last September. Uh, and this followed many years of analysis and a uh, public process by the National Park Service. And finally, uh, last June, the uh, final piece of paper that had to be signed was signed uh, up through the Secretary of the Interior, I'm sure for the review. And then in very, very quick fashion, the National Park Service moved to, to get wolves from the mainland to Isle Royale. Uh, this is one of the wolves that uh, I think number the number two wolf that was released on Isle Royale last September. And uh, she's the one that decided that Isle Royale was not for her. She left in January as soon as she could. As soon as there was an ice bridge formed, uh, she was gone. <laughs> so she went back to the mainland. Uh, I have no idea why. Uh, I think it might have been a mistake, but... <clears throat> That's where she chose to go. So she's back on the mainland and uh, it's too bad. She was a very nice looking wolf. So the Park Service had to, to pull out all the stops and uh, every imaginable <clears throat> conveyance was arranged to uh, move wolves initially last fall from Grand Portage National Monument. Or Grand Portage uh, 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 Reservation of the uh, Lake Superior Chippewa uh, and there were uh, about a dozen trappers involved uh, in trying to catch wolves on the reservation. And of the 12 or so wolves that were caught, uh, four were uh, 
considered uh, candidates for movement to Isle Royale, and they were brought over by plane, by boat, uh, and uh, released. So there was an enormous amount of work involved in all of this. Uh, veterinarians, biologists, trappers. Um, this is the uh, only male that was caught uh, last fall. And uh, it was a very nice looking 75 pound male. But he died about a month after he was released. And uh, the, uh, the proximal cause of death was pneumonia. Uh, according to the pathologists, um, and he hadn't lost any weight. <clears throat> he uh, was apparently eating just fine. So I think there was, it just surprised me that this, uh, this movement from the mainland to the island for individual wolves was a bit more stressful than I would have thought. And I think I would attribute it to basic stress from uh, being separated from family groups, and it certainly wasn't a food-related problem, but not all wolves are able to handle this kind of disruption. And we're learning, you know, it's not, it's not possible to predict who can do it and who can't, but not all wolves will make it. And this is that same wolf uh, feeding off of, a, of some free moose that the National Park Service provided, but it wasn't enough to keep him going. So let's back up a little bit and see what's happened to uh, the wolves of Isle Royale over the decades. This is uh, wolf and moose population trends over the last uh, 60 years or so. And the red line is wolves and they they fell to an all time low of just a couple wolves uh, over the last three years. And that decline was due to inbreeding basically. Uh, in the last uh, 15, 18 years, uh, the wolf population has sunk from a pretty respectable 30 animals down to just two. And those two individuals uh, are unable to reproduce because they're closely related, reproduce successfully at least. And the result of that last decline here in the last five years, six years, uh, has been that uh, the moose population was released from predation and increased from roughly one per square kilometer up to, to uh, three per square kilometer and showed no sign of, of uh, slowing down. So it was that great increase in moose, which was the primary concern of the National Park Service because moose have a tremendous effect on, on, their, on the vegetation that they eat and that they live in. Um, to back up even further, the problem with the wolves is basically inbreeding because they're an isolated small population. And what we've seen over the last 60 years is over the long term, a declining prevalence of ice bridges. And those bridges are what bring or what would allow wolves to, to travel to Isle Royale, some of whom have chosen to stay and reproduce. So, in the 70 year history of wolves on Isle Royale, there's been just two well-documented cases of wolves coming over from the mainland. And it's probably those very rare uh, successful immigrants that have kept the population going all these years. And so it's this, this uh, opportunity for immigration that has been disappearing. And ultimately it's a climate change problem as uh, the, the biggest climate change signal in this part of the world is uh, winters are getting warmer. And then very significantly for Isle Royale, the, the winds on Lake Superior are much higher than they used to be. So the combination, to get an ice bridge, you need below zero temperatures and calm conditions for a couple nights. And then you'll have an ice bridge, but that's increasingly rare. Wolves go out on extremely thin ice, some of them fall through and die as a result, but they, uh, they love to travel over brand new ice surfaces. I think it's just an opportunity for brand new territory and uh, new opportunities. And way over in the eastern part of uh, Lake Superior in this image is Mitch Picotin Island, that little white dot south of the green uh, Puckasaw National Park area and that will feature prominently uh, a little bit later in the program as a as another source of wolves. So moose uh, have been on Isle Royale for over a hundred years. Uh, they probably arrived early in the 1900s. Uh, 
and they found a, a predator free island with lots of forage and they increased at very high levels by the 1930s. So the, some of the first scientific studies ever done of moose were in the late 1920s when there was a huge uh, population of moose on the island and they were having devastating effects on vegetation. So ever since uh, the late 20s, early 30s, there's been some thought for how to, how to rein in this moose population. And uh, prominent conservationists, including Aldo Leopold and Olus Murray and Adolf Murray and Sigurd Olson in the 30s and 40s, all encouraged the Park Service to think about putting wolves at Isle Royal. Uh, and that uh, eventually that wasn't done successfully and, and wolves got to Isle Royal themselves in the late 1940s and that set the stage for everything that's followed since that time. But in general, when you, uh, the, the more predator species you have in a system, the lower will be the average uh, prey density. So this, this graph attempts to show that roughly summarizing results of about 50 different studies around the world. As you go from, on the x-axis from zero to one species of carnivore to two or more species of carnivore, the, uh, the y-axis is ungulates per square mile tends to go down. And it's particularly prominent for the larger ungulates, caribou, elk, moose, and bison. Um, the, and Yellowstone elk is a special case. Uh, those are the blue dots on this graph. Uh, before wolves were added in the mid-1990s, uh, there was an incredibly high density of elk in the northern range, over 15 per square kilometer. And then, of course, wolves were added in 1995, but also, at the same time, grizzly bears were in the process of increasing dramatically during the 1990s, and cougars also increased during that same amount of time. So all of a sudden, we went from almost no carnivores to to all three of the big carnivores, uh, all of whom eat elk. And by uh, well, the last decade or so, northern range elk are down around three per square kilometer, not too much different from the rest of the world when, when there are a lot of carnivores. So that's basically the story. Uh, wolves and, and other carnivores tend to reduce ungulate density. And that's really important for vegetation. Uh, at Isle Royal, uh, we have a boreal forest, basically, with a lot of wetland areas. And uh, we'd seen some amazing things in the first decade of the 21st century when moose were down around one per square kilometer, which is pretty low for Isle Royal. We saw trees began to grow that had never grown in, you know, in decades. Um, so, and we never expected to see that happen, but that, that, uh, re that incipient recovery reversed itself in the last few years when moose population increased about threefold because wolves had disappeared. So I'll spend a little bit of time on terrestrial vegetation, primarily balsam fir, which is the primary food of moose in winter, and then also uh, some comments on aquatic vegetation. Oh yes, beaver. Yeah, I shouldn't forget beaver. <laughs> uh, beaver are an important secondary species of, of wolves from spring to fall during the open water season. And we've uh, had the luxury of having periodic counts of beaver ever since the 1970s, at least every other year. And during 2006 to 2010, uh, beaver were just hanging on about 100 colonies on the whole island. And uh, the, there was about a 50% turnover every year. It would, uh, as soon as a beaver colony got going, it was wiped out, presumably by predation, very quickly. And then wolves crashed in 2000, by 2012. <clears throat> and ever since, beaver have been expanding dramatically. So there's now uh, over 500 uh, active sites on Isle Royal and uh, that has uh, changed a lot of things uh, in wetland areas. So they're an important wetland engineer worth uh, keeping in mind. Uh, the terrestrial story though, it revolves around balsam fir. And this is, this is sort of the signature tree of the boreal forest in Eastern North America. Uh, the, the two 
stems on the left are from trees that were 40, 50, 60 years old and had been chewed on by moose for their whole lives and hadn't grown more than a meter in, in height. And that was pretty much the whole western half of Isle Royal. Uh, looked like this, this beat up scene of balsam fir on the right. And that was pretty much what we were used to. And the future of that sort of forest is not very strong because the canopy trees eventually die off and there's nothing to replace them. And this is pretty much true of all the forest trees on the west half of Isle Royal. Moose are able to suppress regeneration completely. Um, some botanists um, took a recent look at this and pointed out that this has been going on for decades. So the, uh, the canopy breakup that they documented from aerial photos uh, has been slowly happening uh, with the result is the forest is opening up, there's more exotic grasses coming in and the forest is, is reverting to grass, basically spruce and grass. And this, uh, this is the same sort of process that happened uh, in the Canadian Maritime National Parks. It happened much more quickly there because spruce budworm came in and killed off the canopy. But the photo on the right there, uh, which shows some very beat up balsam fir trees and very few trees coming up in the canopy, uh, that could have been taken very easily in, in the Canadian Maritime National Parks, where there's also a very high moose density. And uh, no, virtually no uh, large carnivores at all. So this this really points points to the direction Isle Royal is going if moose are not controlled somehow. Uh, in the in the early or the first decade of the 21st century, um, the uh, scene changed quite quickly for balsam fir because moose uh, had been reduced to the lowest level we'd ever seen them, about one per square kilometer uh, for eight, nine years in a row. And what that meant is that balsam fir trees that had been suppressed for decades began to grow and really remarkable. So the, the shot on the right shows trees that are uh, in excess of two meters tall and they would have the potential to grow into real trees and continue the forest if that trend had continued. <laughs> Oh, this is a technical graph, but it, it basically summarizes what I just uh, told you. The red, the red line is the, the incipient recovery of the forest had things continued. Uh, but uh, they didn't because moose uh, turned around and began to increase very quickly in the last several years. The aquatic story is, uh, is very interesting. It's much more difficult to document because we don't know what's going on under the water and nobody's invented a very good way of monitoring underwater forage abundance in a in an efficient manner but uh, about uh, mid 90 or mid 2000s about 2005 2006 we noticed that several ponds uh, beaver impoundments began to be dominated by this native uh, floating pond weed called uh, water water shield and that shows in the little inset, it can completely cover a water body. And it turns out to be very high in protein and a favored forage of both beaver and moose. And moose uh, discovered this new resource and began to accumulate in huge numbers, uh, such that we'd see sometimes 50, 20 moose, uh, 15 to 20 moose at a time in a pond. And this was a tremendous uh, browsing pressure and uh, wasn't going to last for too long, but it was uh, an indication that things had really changed dramatically, both uh, before and after the uh, the moose population changed. So, um, as the moose population grew from one per square kilometer up to three per square kilometer, the pressure on these ponds became pretty intense, and and the scene on the left there is is sort of the the result of in incredible feeding pressure and defecation and urination by moose fertilization really of these ponds and then the, the shot on the right just shows the the physical damage to moose to these ponds done by foraging moose so it was pretty incredible degradation of some of these aquatic areas and they basically ate 
most basically ate all the aquatic forage available. And they, they eat about 10 times as much forage as beaver do. So they're able to outcompete beaver. Uh, we did, uh, in the, the scenes that were uh, the site of these two photos, we were actually able to measure the uh, water coverage by these plants. And back in 2006, there was no water shield, then it increased to a pretty high level for several years until moose took over. And then within about three, four years, uh, they reduced it again to nothing by 2018. And it, actually that biggest pond, uh, which was 18 hectares in size, a beaver pond that dated back to the early 1950s, uh, the beavers were so uh, outcompeted by moose that they just left or were killed by wolves. And uh, the, the beaver dam broke and the lake drained and that was the end of one of the named lakes for Isle Royal actually. And the final, uh, the final blow was uh, caught on remote camera uh, just after the beaver pond blew in November of, of uh, 2017, I believe. Um, we caught these, these wolves on camera. This first one is the, uh, there were only two wolves left, a male and a female. And this is the male who's got a very full belly and he's carrying a kit beaver in his mouth. He can't can't accommodate eating everything. And they uh, they were finishing off the beaver population. Wild scent marking. <laughs> and then four minutes later, the female came by uh, and scent marked the same uh, bush and uh, went off camera. So that was the end of that, that beaver site. Some of the beavers survived and moved uh, upstream and established another pond. So, in short, uh, severe degradation of aquatic areas by moose. Oops. So these are those same two wolves, the two resident wolves, the only two wolves that have been at Isle Royal for about uh, four years now. Um, <clears throat> they look pretty much alike because they are father and daughter, the male on the left, the female on the right. Uh, he's now eight. Uh, I mean, 10 years old, and she's eight years old. And they, uh, they only reproduced once, as far as we know, back in 2014. And they produced uh, an offspring that was visibly deformed and uh, didn't survive probably even to, to, the, to the age of nine months. So they've stayed together and uh, tended to be highly territorial on one half of Isle Royal, but there's virtually no future based on their performance so far. So this is what the wolf population was finally left with. So we call them the island born pair as to, to distinguish them from the new wolves that have shown up lately. Uh, the, female, the, the female of that pair will simply not accept her father as a mate. So she's made it pretty clear to even to us that she's not interested in mating anymore with him and yet they stay together and they uh they set mark a territory very firmly so they're they're strongly bonded highly territorial in, in even in the absence of reproduction uh there was some speculation that if that female had had access to a new male she'd uh, she'd take off and ditch the old man and seek something better but so far she hasn't quite had that opportunity Uh, this winter, uh, ironically, there was a very good ice bridge for at least five weeks that connected Isle Royal with the Canadian mainland. And during that time, uh, a small group, maybe three wolves, we think, actually came over and checked out Isle Royal and left some urine marks behind and circumnavigated the island uh, and then apparently went home. But the, uh, the resident pair saw these tracks and urine marks and they were pretty agitated about the whole thing. And uh, so they spent many days patrolling their territory and marking it and uh, generally establishing that they were in charge of Isle Royal, period. So um, the, the uh, four wolves that were introduced last 
September and early October from Minnesota, they were reduced to just three females when the male died uh, about a month after he got there. And then in late January, one of the three remaining females left. So there were just two females from Minnesota left for most of the winter, uh, along with the island-born pair. So this is uh, one of those Minnesota females. Uh, when she was released on Isle Royale last, uh, roughly October 1st, she only weighed about 54 pounds, pretty small. Um, and she did, uh, let's see, is this one? Now this is not the one that attempted to leave Isle Royale. She's been content to stay at Isle Royale. And these uh, two, two Minnesota females each operated independently for most of the winter, but they were killing moose calves and doing quite well. And this, uh, this top photograph shows uh, one of the females after gorging herself on a recently killed moose calf. I mean, she must have 25 pounds in her stomach and it looks quite uncomfortable, but uh, so she's figured out how to, how to make a living. And it's just a, a question of who is gonna figure out uh, a, a suitable mate uh, amongst all these new wolves that have come in recently and who will establish territories and succeed. So throughout February, the two new wolves uh, who are, have GPS collars on them were sending out signals every six hours, I believe. And they spent most of their time at the west half of Isle Royale, the, the, uh, the female number one we call the green dots uh, hung out on the extreme southwest side of Isle Royale, killed uh, one, two, three, four calves there um, in about five weeks. and. Uh, she seemed to just be content on uh, sitting out on uh, points, hoping for, I think she was hoping for a male to come by, <laughs> who never did. Uh, F uh, female three, I believe, female four, pardon me, is the red dots and she hung out on another point um, further down the island. And similarly, just seemed to be sedentary in this one area, making lots of tracks and perhaps advertising for a male. I'm not sure. Uh, finally, on the 1st of March, they both uh, left what they were doing and got together and went to the extreme northeast end of Isle Royale. And this was just within a few hours of, of new wolves being dropped off at that west end, right in the middle of where all those green dots were, uh, uh, four new wolves were brought in. So uh, I'm not sure what was going on amongst all these wolves, and I'm not sure they even were very sure about it. But in any case, uh, the new wolves that have been brought in, and there were a bunch of them brought in in the, in the month of March, have thoroughly traveled over Isle Royale, many of them. And it's certainly by now, all the wolves know about each other, even if they haven't come face to face with each other yet. Uh, while all this was going on, we did also have a, a pretty important new project at Isle Royale, which was to uh, radio collar moose with GPS collars for the first time in about 30 years. So, um, and this project should tell us a lot about responsive, moose to a newly established wolf population. It will help us fill in the gaps uh, that we have on how moose, uh, how moose forage, foraging behavior changes with uh, plant chemicals, especially in balsam fir. And also gives us a direct comparison between the demographics of a moose population with and without white-tailed deer, because on the mainland, on the uh, Grand Portage, uh, reservation of the uh, Ojibwe band on the, in the Grand Portage area, there's a similar population of, of moose that has been radio collared for about 10 years and suffers from uh, brainworm mortality because there's white-tailed deer on the mainland that don't exist at Isle Royale. So this will be an interesting comparison. And those moose uh, have been interesting to watch and that's all we're a lot we're able to do at this time of the year is watch their little movements on on the computer screen but they were pretty sedentary until basically last week and then uh, as the snow melted and 
ridges became bare, some of them started some pretty remarkable uh, movements. So uh, we'll put uh, uh, personnel on the ground next month to do some intensive studies of these moose. So we hope for great things there. Meanwhile, March, uh, the month of March this year was, was quite busy. Uh, this shows the number of wolves that have been introduced to Isle Royale in the last uh, six months. Uh, the four wolves initially that came from Minnesota are indicated. And then in the month of March, 11 wolves were brought over from Ontario with the help uh, of Brent Patterson and personnel from Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, significantly, there were eight wolves from Michipicoten Island and then three wolves from the from the mainland area near Wawa, Ontario. So there's all of a sudden 15 wolves on Isle Royale. Uh, and they're, uh, they're mostly just bouncing around uh, uh, more or less like uh, balls on a billiard table trying to figure out, well they all know they're on an island by now and they can't get off of it. But I think there, there'll be a lot of sorting out who's going to uh, take up with whom and who might succeed in terms of breeding and uh, reproduction and territorial territory establishment. So this uh, this is big changes for Isle Royal. Um, I was quite surprised uh, to see a black wolf show up because I, I had I understood that the uh, the Michipicoten wolves were slated for for uh, transfer if if it was possible, but they're all gray and and. Uh, but turns out there were some uh, mainland wolves that uh, Ontario provincial personnel had spotted on a, on a moose kill and they were able to move some of those wolves as well. So I was really hoping for black wolves because they they add a lot of diversity to the, to the mix. They're easy to tell from gray wolves for, for us identifying them from aircraft and they have a unique genetic uh, complement that's uh, different from gray wolves. So. This is a, a young female that came from the Ontario mainland. Another shot of her. They have big bright ear tags on in case they should end up on the mainland for some reason. They could be identified yet as a wolf that started out at Isle Royale. And then the, uh, there were also wolves from Mitch Picot and a couple males that came over early in March. Um, and these were two wolves uh, that helped found a wolf population on Mitzvikoten uh, in about 2014, I believe. Three wolves, two males and a female, found their way to Mitzvikoten, which had been wolf-free and predator-free for the entire history of the caribou population, uh, which uh, dates back to the mid-80s. So this caribou population had been established by the, uh, uh, by the provincial authorities in the 80s, more or less as a, as a refuge, a safety area for caribou, which, which had declined tremendously throughout the Lake Superior area. And so when wolves got there in 2014 uh, and began killing caribou, it certainly raised some concern about the future of that caribou population. So in 2018, the caribou had been reduced to just a small remnant population, which was largely removed uh, and moved to more, more safe islands in Lake Superior, leaving the wolves without a lot to eat. So uh, they, uh, through some heroic efforts by Ontario personnel, the wolves were kept alive after, uh, well, through this past uh, early and midwinter period when the beaver were all under the ice and unavailable. And uh, these are the first two males that came in. The one on the right, uh, I believe, is the, the breeding male that came over originally to Michipicoten Island and then a, a male associate on the left. This is that alpha male when he uh, took off and was released at Isle Royale. Immediately, his behavior was quite different from the females that had been released from Minnesota. Uh, one of those females, in fact, we had never succeeded in seeing from aircraft. She was extremely shy and kept hidden. She never spent any time on her uh, on the kills she made, even though there's no other wolves around. Uh, she was just not going to spend any time in a 
vulnerable situation. But as soon as this wolf was released, uh, he found one of the kills of this uh, Minnesota female and immediately just sat on it uh, very assertively and uh, yeah, obviously had a very different approach to uh, making a living from the uh, from some of his associates. And he went, uh, went right away to the east end of Isle Royale and perhaps if there'd been an ice bridge, he would have just tried to go home to Mitch Picotin, but uh, ice bridge uh, was gone by that time and he uh, was stuck on Isle Royale. So, so the, uh, the wolves that were all moved to Isle Royale in March uh, all stayed at Isle Royale uh, because they had to and it remains to be seen now what, uh, how, they'll sh how they'll mold their own lives in futures. So the, uh, the, uh, all this activity, and it's been an enormously expensive to, to reintroduce wolves to Isle Royale, calls to mind a quote from Tom Hobbs uh, at Colorado State University, who said, there's no quick fix once an apex predator is gone. Maintaining an intact ecosystem is so much easier than trying to restore it once the pieces have been lost. So in, in many ways, it's quite remarkable that the National Park Service, you know, in 2018, uh, recognizing climate change as a, an ultimate problem, chose to restore uh, this very controversial top carnivore to Isle Royale. But it, uh, it's been an effort that uh, has really consumed the staff and lots of other people for the past uh, year. And, uh, it's a work in progress, so we'll see how it all how it all works out. So, Maggie, I'd be happy to to try and respond to questions at this point. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rolf. Uh, we will go ahead and take some questions um, in just a minute. Sure. Uh, first, for those of you who joined um, after our in our introduction. Uh, we are here with Dr. Rolf Peterson, and he just finished his talk uh, about the wolves of Isle Royale. Um, for those with questions, we do have a Q&A box in the control panel, so please type them in there and we'll get to as many as possible. Okay, so the first question um, asks, um, you mentioned the female who left the island, um, or sorry, you mentioned the female that left the island was wearing a tracking collar, is she be still being tracked and by whom? Well, the National Park Service, uh, I mean, the, I should explain, the National Park Service is responsible for the entire wolf introduction. So they, uh, they organized and, and uh, planned all the logistics and all the, uh, all the efforts to introduce wolves. So they, uh, they are monitoring uh, the, the collared wolves and uh, will be reporting on their, on their schedule. I do have access to it, so it's a fascinating story, but I'm not, I'm not allowed to share it just yet. So, but she's still alive and still making uh, interesting movements on the mainland. Well, that's definitely good to hear. Um, and this uh, question uh, is actually uh, asked by someone in fourth grade who loves wolves uh -huh. and the Isle Royal. Um, so this webinar is very interesting um, to them. But the question is, how many wolves are currently living at Isle Royale? Well, we think there's uh, at least 13 radio collared wolves. And then the, the, the two, the two island-born wolves, we would presume, are still alive. So 15 would be the population estimate at the end of March. And uh, the uh, island-born pair, we will we may never know what happens to them because they're not collared and uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're getting old and we'll see how they interact with these new wolves. We may see how they interact with these new wolves. Yeah, there are actually many questions uh, wondering what the status of the, the island born pair is. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, are the wolves released on Isle Royale Canis nubilis? Why was it decided to bring wolves from Canada versus Wisconsin? Oh, um, the wolves uh, that were released, as far as we know, are all Canis lupus. Uh, there is some 
you know, the old Nubilis story of the Plains wolf uh, may be part of their genetic heritage, but they're, uh, certainly the Ontario wolves seem to be large wolves uh, that would be straight Canis lupus. The Minnesota wolves are not quite as big, uh, and there is some uh, influence in Minnesota and, and Michigan and Wisconsin from, from, the, from the Eastern wolf. Um, so I, that, for that reason, I was, for the reason that these Ontario wolves were quite large, I was, I was certainly pushing for them all along because they're experienced moose killers, they're large bodied animals and much bigger than the original wolf population at Isle Royal. So uh, to have them involved and in, uh, now on the ground is, uh, is the best sort of outcome. Um, the Park Service uh, may supplement the current population uh, yet in the future, uh, depending on how these wolves sort themselves out. Um, and uh, the original intent was to try to get wolves from perhaps three different locations, Minnesota, Michigan, and Ontario, in the hopes of in starting with an initial population that was pretty high in genetic diversity and might have a longer run time than, uh, than if the population had been founded the way it would naturally go, which would be a, a, a pair that reproduces and, and then populates the island with their own offspring. Um, so uh, in reality, of course, it will depend on who, who mates with whom and how, how, how able they are to take over the island. So uh, we would expect there'll be some winners and losers in all of this, and the winners may take over the whole island pretty quickly. Um, but the initial effort was to try and maximize genetic diversity right at the outset in the hope that it would go on its own for a much longer period of time before being uh, beset by inbreeding, if indeed there's no more ice on Lake Superior. Well, that answers a few of these questions. Um, this one's related, uh, basically, uh, what parameters did the team consider in choosing uh, the wolves for relocation? It sounds like uh, genetics was uh, pretty high up there on the priority. Um, were family groups uh, considered, or was that just on from the island? Yeah, I think, well, it's changed, I think. The, the Minnesota effort last September, um, there were several wolf packs that were targeted, and individuals were trapped out of, out of several different packs. They, there was a Park Service veterinarian on site, and so the wolves had to pass a basic physical test, uh, being in reasonably good condition, and um, you know, free of any injuries. And then they hoped for even numbers of males and females, but, uh, you know, plans had to uh, accommodate reality in the end. Uh, so just four wolves out of a dozen or more were actually selected for release at Isle Royal last fall. And it turns out uh, in the end, uh, there were three females and one male and the male died. So right away there was concern about uh, an unbalanced sex ratio and lack of males. So this winter, um, with the Mitch Picotin opportunity, uh, that was sort of a different, uh, different situation because that's a, that's a one-time opportunity. These wolves without a prey base were not gonna last very long. In fact, they were losing weight and there was concern about their survival. So, um, I think the uh, the effort was made to get as many of these those wolves as possible, and even if they were in poor shape, uh, move them to Isle Royal, where at least they have a, a an opportunity to survive and flourish. And uh, those were all animals that were very large uh, originally, even if they had lost weight. So, so they were moved more or less as a an entire pack. Uh, so the the first wolves from Grand Portage may have come in pretty much as individuals on their own, uh, whereas the, uh, the Mitch Picotin wolves were all basically familiar with each other. And then the, the other three wolves from the mainland uh, were all taken from the same wolf-killed moose, but it's not sure yet what their, what their pack relationship was originally. So um, 
it does appear at least by the end of March by that everybody was more or less on their own. There were some some alliances that had formed a couple of wolves hanging together, but uh, you know it re remains to be seen. In many cases, there were you know two males together, uh, uh, so they they weren't necessarily breeding pairs that were forming yet. And the, the the March the wolves that were brought in in March came in really a little bit late for breeding this year. Although uh, it's possible that wolves could still breed in March and reproduce, but. Uh, and one of the females from Mitchell was thought to perhaps be pregnant. Um, uh, so yeah, that all remains to be seen. But the, the Mitchell wolves were not in great nutritional shape because they'd been on a very poor diet for for many months. Uh, so the the standards were were somewhat different for the winter operation. Okay, another uh, grade schooler, we have a sixth grader who also loves wolves, we like hearing that. Um, and you did answer, it sounds like this question, just really how are the wolves in Isle Royale in terms of packs? And it sounds like they're still perhaps not forming family groups, but perhaps soon in the future we'll see that. Um, here's a good question that a lot of people seem to be asking. Um, what is the minimum population needed to retain functional genetic diversity? And does Isle Royale have uh, the carrying capacity to do this? Well, the short answer is no. There's no way Isle Royale could ever have enough wolves to, to, be, uh, to maintain genetic diversity over you know, many, many decades. So the, the effective population size at Isle Royale is, is ridiculously small, just you know, three, four animals. Uh, so we've known for uh, many decades that there's just no way this can continue in the absence of immigration, uh, in the absence of new wolves coming in and, and rejuvenating that, that uh, gene base. So, um, yeah, the carrying capacity for wolves, we know what it is. It's somewhere between 20 and 30, maybe as high as 50 at times, based on previous history at least. And uh, those numbers, because the wolves are organized in packs, only a few of them are actually reproducing. There's no way they can maintain genetic variability. So at the, at the level where wolf population has typically been at Isle Royale, they lose about 15% of genetic variability every generation. So what, is, what has saved the population for 70 years probably are two things. One is very occasional immigration by a successful immigrant that comes in and, and breeds. And then also the breeding wolves live very long lives, sometimes 10, 12 years. So the generation, generation time is long compared to wolves on the mainland, and that will tend to forestall the appearance of, of genetic inbreeding. Um, the next question asks, is there a human uh, are there any humans living on Isle Royale? And what about in the past? Oh, t uh, humans are present only temporarily each year at Isle Royale, roughly from uh, late April to late October. So uh, for six months of the year, the National Park is actually closed to visitation. It's the only national park in the US that's closed periodically. Um, so we, we as, a, as researchers, we come in during that closed period uh, by special permit in January and have a very small presence as researchers and uh, uh, maintain all of our activities in this one small area. And, and we fly, of course, we fly aerial counts to, uh, to do the work that we uh, do in the winter to maintain counts of wolves and moose and kill rates uh, by wolves of moose. But basically, the the uh, the, pop, the the island is very lightly populated by people, and only during the summertime. So it's one of the least visited national parks in the United States. Sounds amazing. <laughs> um, is the uh, current relocation project uh, the first effort to relocate wolves onto Isle Royale? Um, it's the second one. Um, there was a. a an effort in the early 1950s uh, after the calls by Aldo Leopold and others to reintroduce wolves, uh, there was an effort, a private effort 
begun uh, in 1951 or so to put wolves at Isle Royal. And uh, so there was a, a bounty actually offered for live wolves in Michigan that could be moved to Isle Royal. Uh, and the uh, person organizing it was a Detroit newspaperman named Lee Smits. And Smits was unable to find any wolves, wild wolves in Michigan. So he used wolves from the Detroit Zoo. And four wolves were moved to Isle Royal in August 1952, even though there were some tracks of wild wolves that had been documented. So there were, there were some wolves present, wild wolves, but uh, the, the effort to reintroduce these four went ahead anyway, and it was pretty much unsuccessful. Uh, the, the wolves were habituated to people, they became pests, and uh, three weeks later, they, they were gone, essentially and never seen again. Some of them, one was shot, dumped in the lake, one was recaptured and sent back to the zoo, and the other two were never seen again. May, one may have been shot and killed, and the, the records are, are not uh, easy to interpret, but it didn't work out. And in any case, wild wolves had gotten there probably a year or two earlier, and uh, were, in the, were in the process of establishing themselves. So. Uh, we did learn at that point uh, that you can't just dump captive wolves out on an island and hope they uh, became become wild wolves. Uh, you got to start with wild wolves. Well, there were a few questions uh, regarding that, so I think you answered that. So thank you. Um, and uh, also a few questions um, about uh, using wolves that have been uh, uh, I'm not actually reading it, I'm trying to remember what the question said now, um, that have been deemed as problem wolves uh, mm -hmm. for livestock conflict. Um, why not choosing some of those wolves from uh, the greater or the Great Lakes region? Oh, I think it would probably work actually. Um, um, that wasn't done and I, uh, I think the, the National Park Service thought it, it would be better to use wolves that had no, had no uh, run-ins with people, as it were, but no, I think um, uh, livestock depredators might work just fine. Uh, they certainly know about people. Uh, they have no opportunity to feed on domestic animals at Isle Royal, and they're pretty pretty shy of people. So I, I don't think I would be against using depredating wolves as a source population. But um, but that was not the direction the Park Service wanted to go. Uh, in this first round at any rate. You know, there's many ways to do this uh, and the Park Service uh, determined one direction and then uh, went that way. So it's not the only way it could have been done though. Interesting. Um, here's another, any thoughts on the current discussions on reintroducing wolves into Colorado? Mm, Colorado. Um, well, there's evidently plenty of country in Colorado. They certainly have a prey base in the mountainous west half of the state. Um, well, it's it's a uh, it's a bit of a dilemma in in terms of wolf human interaction primarily. For the wolves, it's it's a no brainer. They they do just fine in Colorado. So uh, it's mainly a question of whether people are are able to accommodate uh, living with wolves in that state. So you've got the same issues that you had in uh, in the northern Rockies with areas outside the parks that have uh, domestic animals and you have to have ways to control wolves that don't necessarily stay in the mountainous parks uh, heat, feeding on elk but rather go out on the, the flatlands and feed on other things like cattle. Um, so in many ways, it's similar to the, to the border between Yellowstone National Park and Wyoming. Uh, when you come out of the mountains of Yellowstone into the flats of Wyoming, you've got an entirely different ecosystem and one in which wolves may not fit very well, very successfully, because they get into conflict with people. So, uh, but you know, I, th I think uh, if the people of Colorado are able to accommodate what comes with wolves, uh, it certainly could work. But it's going to have to take a little while and some uh, 
some major efforts at education and and probing of the public psyche on living with wolves. I will say that um, you know if, uh, I live in Upper Michigan, and 40 years ago there was I mean you would be a lunatic to think that you'd put wolves in here in Upper Michigan uh, because of human opposition, uh, and there was even an attempt uh, to to introduce wolves in the early 70s, just four wolves were brought in to see if they'd survive. Is, is there a prey base? And of course there was, they did fine, but they were all killed within six months. Uh, and then nothing was attempted again to introduce wolves into Upper Michigan. Wolves have found their own way into Michigan. And uh, the wolves they got here were pretty smart and able to avoid, to a great extent, interacting with people. And the agricultural base here in the Upper Peninsula largely vanished, so there's not a huge issue with uh, depredation, killing of domestic animals by wolves. And uh, so now in 30,000 square kilometers of Upper Michigan, there's six, 700 wolves, and they're pretty invisible, and it's not a big social issue. Deer hunters complain, uh, but that's not anything new. So, but otherwise, wolves have uh, adjusted to the UP, and, and UP residents seem to have largely adjusted to wolves. So it's it's not a big deal necessarily. But on you know in those western landscapes where you can see for miles, it's a little bit different. Here in Upper Michigan, wolves can hide in the woods, as they always have, and uh, so the lack of forests makes it a lot tougher for wolves to survive and. Uh, and coexist with people. Um, a very popular topic uh, in the Q&A, and you've touched on it a little bit, is has any breeding occurred? <laughs> um, and uh, what do you think about that? Oh yeah, I, um, you know, I was sitting there in February just taking off the days, <laughs> knowing that Usually wolves mate during the third week of February, but they could mate any time during February and early March. But obviously that opportunity went by and there was only one male and four or three females throughout that month of February and nothing happened. So I thought, well, okay, that was it. Um, and then uh, four wolves, three males and a female were brought in about the first of March. And, uh, the female was kind of young and there was no indication that she'd already mated. Uh, and, you know, it's a little bit late, so maybe she had an opportunity to mate. Uh, we don't know. There was no indication uh, that that happened in the month of March. And then this bunch of wolves were brought in at the end of March, one of whom may have already been pregnant. So I did ask uh, Cheryl Asa at the St. Louis Zoo, who's an endocrinologist that's studied wolf reproduction for a long, long time. Uh, uh, regarding the wolves in, in February, where there's one male and females that were probably fertile but had no access to, fem to a male, could they, could they cycle again in another, you know, whatever, three, four weeks? And she didn't think so, but she, she pointed out that there's a lot of variation among individuals in when they mate. And even for an individual female from year to year, uh, she might uh, ovulate at a very different time of year. So um, there's no, no way to be sure whether reproduction or, or mating could have happened even in March. So we don't know. We just have to wait and see. Uh, and the, uh, uh, so that, that's, probably the major objective of the of the National Park Service this summer is to monitor closely enough to see if reproduction happened. We're pretty sure that the resident pair, the island-born pair, will not be reproducing. And uh, so the, the question there is, will they even be alive uh, next winter? And we'll just have to, to wait and see if we can find them directly by aerial survey. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Um, and just a, a quick note, here at the Wolf Conservation Center, we're actually monitoring um, one of our critically endangered Mexican gray wolves very closely uh, because she is enormous and is about to have pups any second now. 
So right before we tuned in with Rolf, uh, we were gathered around our computers watching the poor, poor girl on webcam. So you guys can check out our website if you want to follow Mexican wolf trumpet around for the rest of the evening. <laughs> but um, yeah, this is the time of year when they should be reproducing, Then you know, this next two, three weeks. Exactly. It's puppy season. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to, Rolf, there, I mean, I don't think we've ever seen so many questions. Oh, okay. uh, so it's fabulous. But um, this one, uh, well, ask, maybe this one for the last one, um, have coyotes or any other predators uh, found their way to Isle Royal during the 60 year study? Uh, uh, coyotes did find their way to Isle Royal early in the 1900s, uh, showing up in the, by the, certainly by the 20s. Uh, there were probably hundreds of coyotes present, uh, at least enough so that an individual trapper could catch several dozen of them. And uh, so they became quite numerous during a period when there weren't any wolves at Isle Royal at all. Um, and then uh, in the seven years between 1949 and 1956, uh, all the coyotes on Isle Royal disappeared. So just as wolves became established, coyotes vanished. So I think uh, it's pretty clear wolves just killed them all, which is quite amazing. Um, and since that time, uh, we're not aware of any, any coyotes coming over, except perhaps one in the late 1990s. Uh, there was a small animal that we saw three years in a row that looked awfully tiny, and uh, uh, we just never figured out if it's really a wolf or if it could be a coyote. And it was always by itself, and it, it survived for a while, but didn't take hold. So. Uh, it's pretty much a, a, a wolves only system, no bears, and that's really important. Uh, so wolves are the only top carnivore present. Interesting, and I lied. There is one more question um, okay. that, I would, that I think is important. Um, is there a website uh, one can access to follow the progress of Isle Royal wolves moving forward? Yeah, you have to go to the National Park Service, Isle Royal National Park. Uh, if you if you navigate through their uh, various pages, you will find one on uh, on wolf introduction, and they try to keep that sort of up to date. Uh, and then, uh, but that's the, the major, the only real source of new information. So, uh, during the summertime, uh, well, we'll be rolling out information on both. Uh, we'll be rolling out information on radio collared moose, and then the Park Service will be responsible for disseminating wolf information as well. So their website would be a major, the only major source. Great, and I know that, um, I know I personally follow the, the wolves and moose of Isle Royal on uh, Facebook too. Oh yeah, it's yeah, we, I better give that a plug. Uh, <laughs> you we'll better. Be, we'll be posting new information there. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a very diverse website because uh, whatever I happen to let, want to post gets posted. <laughs> well, while we didn't cover all the questions, uh, we have covered a lot. So thank you, Rolf. Is there anything yeah. else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Oh, I uh, yeah, Maggie mentioned Brent Patterson might be on the on the show, so I I want to call out his tremendous contribution <laughs> to especially getting Ontario wolves to Isle Royal. That was a heroic effort. Indeed, and thank you, Brent, for, for signing up to watch the webinar tonight. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you, Rolf, so much, um, and thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Um, again, if you'd like to learn more about uh, the Wolf Moose Project and the Wolf Relocation Project in Isle Royal, you can look at the National Park Service website or on the Moose and Wolves, uh, or sorry, Wolves and Moose of Isle Royal uh, on Facebook. And if you'd like to learn more about the Wolf Conservation Center, our scientific webinar series, or the 47 wolves who currently call the center home, hopefully it'll be more than 47 any moment now, uh, please visit uh, www.nywolf.org. So nywolf.org. Rolf, thanks again for offering your time with us tonight. This has been really interesting. 
And again, um, the questions are still pouring in. So uh, this is a record for us in terms of questions. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll see okay. you next time. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.